Hello, this is David Rubenstein. I'm here with David Quammen, who has written an incredibly prescient book called Spillover. He wrote it in 2012 when he predicted there might be a lot of pandemics coming, and at the time, people weren't so sure about it. David, thank you very much for agreeing to let me interview you today. Thank you, David. It's good to be with you. Before I get into how you thought of this topic, uh, you have uh, a lot of books behind you. Are those books you've read or written, and where are you coming from? <laughs> I'm in my office in Bozeman, Montana. Um, it's a room lined with books, as you see. That's not wallpaper. Those are actual books. I've read most of them, but certainly not all of them. And I've written most of the ones over in that corner over there. So you have a very interesting background, which I'd like to just make sure everybody understands. Uh, you grew up in Cincinnati, is that right? That's correct, yep. And you had intended to go to a uh, Catholic or a parochial school for college? Yes, yeah. I was a good Catholic kid at a Jesuit high school planning uh, to apply to Georgetown Holy Cross and Boston College. And I had a Jesuit teacher who said, why don't you think about Yale? And I said, why Yale, Father? And he said, because Yale has a great English department. I said, what's so great about Yale's English department? He said, well, they have Penn Warren for starters. I said, who's Penn Warren? And he explained to me who Robert Penn Warren was. And I went to Yale and the next great mentor I had was Robert Penn Warren. And you ultimately won a Rhodes Scholarship. So what did you do to attract the Rhodes Scholar Committee to give you a Rhodes Scholarship in 1970? <laughs> uh, well, again, it was Penn Warren. He said to me, uh, he knew me well. I was studying Faulkner with him. And uh, he had read a draft of my first novel. And at one point, my senior year, he said, um, are you going to apply for a Rhodes Scholarship? And I said, uh, well, what's that, sir? And he said, well, it's two years at Oxford. And uh, I said, well, I don't really want to do two years of graduate work at Oxford, Mr. Warren. I, I want to be a writer like you. And he literally came halfway out of his chair and he said, of course you don't want to spend two years at Oxford, but you'll be three hours from Paris, man. And I said, well, yes, sir, in that case. And he said, fine, I'll write you a recommendation. So I, I had, I suppose, other qualifications, but it certainly put wind in my sails to have an impassioned recommendation from Robert Penmore. He had been a Rhodes Scholar himself in about 1924. So if you get a letter from Robert Penmore, I guess it's pretty literate, pretty well written. <laughs> I never saw the letter, but I think we can assume that. Okay, so you went to Oxford and ultimately uh, you came back to the United States briefly for a political uh, campaign, is that right? That's right, yeah. Right before I was about to submit my master's thesis, um, Richard Nixon blockaded Haiphong Harbor. This is May of 72. I dropped everything I quit. I left Oxford the next day. I came back to work for George McGovern. And so you ultimately decided though, when you were finished with Oxford, that you wanted to be a writer, a, a novelist more than a nonfiction writer. Is that right? Yes, I had actually published a, a novel before that. I published a novel immediately after graduation from Yale. So I had that under my belt when I went to Oxford. I finished the McGovern campaign. I went back to Oxford, turned in the thesis, got my degree, and then immediately uh, came back to the U.S. and moved to Montana in a Volkswagen bus filled with Penguin books and a fly rod and an electric typewriter to be a writer. And you realize that writing novels doesn't always work out so easily. Is that right? So did you ever wait on tables or anything like that I as did, well? I did all those things, yeah. I paid my dues, David, between the first book and the second book, rather than the more conventional way of paying your dues before the first book. So between book one and book two, I was a waiter and a bartender and a professional fishing guide and a ghostwriter. And then after 13 years, I, I managed to... Uh, sell my second book. During that period, I was still writing some fiction, writing some spy novels, but slowly turning into a nonfiction writer focused on, on science and the natural world. So you did some work for the National Geographic and other magazines, is that right? Yes. Um, for 15 years, I wrote a column for Outside Magazine. And for 20 years, I was, uh, I was doing most of my magazine work for National Geographic. And now I'm a freelancer again, uh, writing for whatever magazine I want to. Um, but uh, those two magazines really, really helped me along for a total of about 35 years. So when you're writing for those kind of magazines, very often you have to do outside work, and I guess you have to go through fairly dangerous things. Did you actually go to some places that were dangerous when you were writing for those magazines? <laughs> um, I won't say I made a habit of it, but yes, that was part of what I 
offered to those magazines, part of what I did was to go to wild places and try and write intelligent, literate, well-reported stories about the natural world or about science. So, um, you know, I would go to jungles and swamps and, and, and mountains and deserts um, and hike through forests with, you know, dotty young biologists and wade through swamps and, and uh, bring back these stories. So did your family ever tell you this was not the safest thing to do? Yes, they did, but they were, they were used to it, both my, my parents while they were alive and my wife. They knew that's part of who I was. Uh, and my wife would occasionally worry about it. And I would say, look, when I go to the Congo um, and hike through this jungle for two weeks, probably the most dangerous moment is the taxi ride in from the Kinshasa airport. So when you uh, came up with the idea for a spillover, the idea came to you from one of your trips, the idea of writing a book about viruses jumping from animals to humans. Where did the idea for this book come from? I got very interested in Ebola virus, first of all. I was doing an assignment for National Geographic back in 1999 or 2000, walking through the Congo jungle for weeks at a time, <clears throat> following um, an intrepid American um, ecologist conservationist named Mike Fay on his, he called it the mega transect. He was on the trail for 456 days through the last great forests of Central Africa. And I walked um, about a, a tenth of that. I walked about, you know, eight weeks with him in different sections. And one section that we walked was through Ebola habitat, this section of forest in northeastern Gabon, known to be Ebola virus habitat because there had been an outbreak in a village among humans on the edge of it. So somewhere in that forest, I knew, lived the Ebola virus in its reservoir host is the term, the animal in which a virus lives secretly, uh, inconspicuously when it's not spilling over and infecting humans. And the reservoir host was unknown, still actually unknown, which animal carries the Ebola virus. Um, but I knew it was there. I, it was around us somewhere. We had to be careful. We didn't want, we certainly weren't going to eat any dead monkeys that we found on the ground. We wouldn't have done that anyway, even if it wasn't Ebola territory. Um, and I got very interested in the ecology and the evolutionary biology of this virus, Ebola virus, and wrote about it once for National Geographic and then decided this is a book project for me. I had learned that this this phenomenon of viruses spilling over from an animal host to a human was called the, the phenomenon of zoonotic disease. These were zoonoses. And I decided to write a book on this, this whole subject. So when it came out in 2012, did your friends say, hey, you're making a big deal out of a nothing. It's really not such a serious problem. And did you feel that people were paying enough attention to the disease problem that you were alerting people to? Well, some people had that reaction, my friends and others, yeah. but you know, viruses that come out of animals and get into humans. The sub, subtitle of my book was uh, Animal Infections in the Next Human Pandemic. And some people thought, well, this is kind of an obscure thing out on the edge that David, the kind of thing that David likes. Um, the book was well-reviewed. It sold pretty well, had a cup of coffee on the bestseller list, um, but it wasn't hugely received. Um, the people who read it um, carefully and reviewed it generally said, yeah, this is, this is important. Uh, this is serious. We should pay attention to this. But there just weren't that many of them. There was no great groundswell around it. So it, it disappeared for eight years or so. And now, uh, now it seems to be back in vogue. So when what's now called COVID-19 arose in at Wuhan, um, did you think at that time that it was likely to lead to this incredible global pandemic? Or you didn't think it was going to be such a big deal at that time? No, I thought as soon as I heard the word coronavirus, I thought, okay, this could be what I had called eight years earlier, the next big one. This could be the next big one. An editor for the New York Times emailed me on, I think it was about January 20th or 21st and said, hey, um, we'd like you to do an, another op-ed for us uh, about anything you want, but you know, maybe this Wuhan virus. It was that casual at that point. And I said, yes, yes, the Wuhan virus quote unquote, then. We don't call it that anymore. At least most of us don't call it that anymore. Um, but I said, yeah, this is important. I want to write an op-ed about that. So I wrote an op-ed, which published January 28th, saying, people, this could be the next big one. This could really sweep around the world and cause a lot of misery and death. 
because it's a coronavirus, because it's evolutionarily malleable, protein, uh, it could be very, very dangerous. Explain to people who are uh, watching why it is that a virus could be in an animal and the animal is going about its business, doesn't seem to be adversely affected by it, but when it escapes and goes to humans, it can really damage humans. Why is that? Well, the reason is that the relationship with that animal, let's, let's posit a bat, let's say this virus or virus A was living in a bat. Um, inconspicuously, the bat is the reservoir host. It, the virus has probably had a million year relationship with that reservoir host. It, it has reached a point where it is living there relatively dormant. The reservoir host gives it security, gives it long-term uh, refuge. And so the virus doesn't cause much trouble. It doesn't replicate abundantly. It doesn't flow massively through the, through the veins of, of that animal. And also bats have tolerant immune systems. So a bat um, immune system tends to leave more, more than our immune system, tends to leave an alien form, an alien body alone. So it comes out of that it, by, by accident, it spills over and infects another kind of host, say a human, and this is new habitat. This is a whole new deal. And like any sort of an, an animal, say, colonizing a new habitat, birds being blown offshore um, to a volcanic island where there are no birds um, landing there and, and, you know, 19 out of 20 times, those birds that are blown off course and land on an island will die out. But one time out of 20, or one time out of 100, they will colonize. And they will find that there are no competitors and there are no predators in this great new habitat. And they will flourish in that place. And that's what happens sometimes with a virus when it gets into a new host, such as a human. It happens to be either pre-adapted to um, being able to enter our cells and replicate and proliferate and come out, uh, or it adapts quickly to be able to do that better. And then it discovers that it can transmit from one human to another, if it happens to be able to adapt to that capacity. And, and then suddenly an animal virus, a non-human animal virus, a bat virus has become a human virus. Now, you point out in your book that there are a lot of bats in the world, more than I realize. Bats are, you know, a very common animal around the world, and bats get blamed for a lot of these viruses, and maybe for this particular virus, the COVID-19. What is it about bats that make them so prevalent in the world and also so likely to produce uh, viruses for humans? Well, first of all, bats are not just abundant, but they are highly diverse. So one in every five species of mammal on Earth is a bat. 20% of all mammal diversity is bat diversity, all these different species, something like 1,100 to 1,200 different species of bat. So you've got a lot of kinds of bat, and it's possible that this genus or that genus harbors unique viruses, which would seem to make them overrepresented as reservoir hosts of dangerous viruses that have come to humans, simply because they are overrepresented in mammal diversity. But there are additional things. Bats live a long time. They live long lifetimes. Even a little bat can live more than 20 years. Um, you know, a mouse the same size is lucky to live two years. Um, they live in great aggregations. They roost together. It might be 60,000 bats in a big scrum on the wall of a cave, um, roosting there three or four bats deep, like a great buffalo robe hanging on the wall of a cave. So long lives, close interaction of dense populations, perfect situation for viruses to recirculate endlessly in a population. And then add to that one other thing, their immune systems seem to have evolved a tolerance for, as I said, for alien bodies, for alien DNA, for, for suspect um, proteins in their bodies. And so their immune systems don't react as, uh, as forcefully, as quickly as immune systems in, in other mammals. And essentially their immune systems say, yeah, there's some virus floating around in this body that I'm supposed to protect, but I'm gonna leave the virus alone um, and just uh, you know, let it be. Bats do that. So the combination means that they're carrying a lot of viruses, some of which are potentially dangerous to humans, but only dangerous if we come in contact with bats. Bats don't bring their viruses to us. They don't come looking for us. They don't bite us. They don't spit on us. It only happens when we disturb them. Let's talk about the, a wet market. For people who live in the West who may not have actually seen or been to a wet market, 
uh, where COVID-19 is thought to have uh, originated. What is a wet market? And are there bats actually in wet markets or is some other animal that would have had a virus escape? As a, a Chinese friend of mine um, said to me about a month ago, remember wet market, that's, that's a term that we use in English to apply to, um, to a particular kind of market in China or in Africa. And he said, what you're calling a wet market is a place where my father took me to get fresh vegetables. So a quote unquote wet market is a market that contains lots of kinds of fresh food. I mean, if you go to a farmer's market in New England on a, on a Saturday afternoon in the summer, that could be called a wet market because it's probably got chickens um, and it's got vegetables and it's got, uh, might, have, might have ducks. Um, anyway, but in, in the sense that we're concerned, a, a wet market in China or elsewhere is one that contains live wild animals captured from the wild, brought in and, and kept in confinement adjacent to other forms of food, seafood, live and dead, um, birds of all sorts, wild birds as well as chickens and, um, and ducks, um, um, vegetables of all sorts. So you've got this great admixture of all kinds of food and you've got blood flowing off of um, butcher boards, uh, you've got water flowing around, things are splashing, viruses are coming out of the wild animals, they may be dropping down on some of the domestic animals, plus you've got people crowded in, and there's this great potential for viral transfer. So one of, one of the points in your book is that humans have been on the face of the earth for you know millions of years, let's say, homo sapiens maybe three or four hundred thousand years, animals for a billion years or so, but all of a sudden because we're getting more people and more animals are interacting, we're more likely to have these kind of diseases. Is that right? Because we're more interacting with them than we did before? Yes, yes, it, absolutely. It's not a, a categorically new thing. It's a matter of scale. The difference is scale. As you say, we're a relatively young species, 200,000, 300,000 years. But from the beginning, we have been um, hunting and gathering killing and eating wild animals. That's not new. What's new is that there are 7.8 billion of us on the planet now, humans. Um, so it's scale. Um, we are um, proportionally invading wild diverse ecosystems more, more often, more disruptively, coming into contact with more wild animals carrying more viruses, giving them more opportunity to spill into us and once that happens, we are closely interconnected with one another. We live in dense aggregations in cities. We travel from city to city. Uh, a virus in a human can move from the village to the town, to the city, to the airport fairly quickly. And once it gets to the airport, it can be on the other side of the world in 17 or 18 hours. Um, so all of those things um, result in a greater likelihood of dangerous viruses spilling over. And once a spillover occurs, a greater likelihood that it can turn into not just a localized outbreak, but an epidemic or a pandemic. Let's talk about some of the viruses we've seen recently. So you mentioned one of them, which is uh, HIV, uh, which leads to AIDS. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we know where that actually comes from? Oh, yes. There's a wild story, very counterintuitive story that's in my book. It's in Spillover, thanks to the work of a number of scientists, including Beatrice Hahn and her group, University of Alabama, Michael Warby, his group at uh, University of Arizona. And they ascertained from molecular evidence um, the understanding that the pandemic strain of HIV, which is HIV 1 group M, spilled over from a single chimpanzee into a single human in the southeastern corner of Cameroon in Central Africa back around 1908, give or take a margin of error. Very different from what we think we know of the history of AIDS, you know, starting to turn up in 1980, 1981 in American cities. It's got a much deeper history than that. Um, and it traces back to that little corner of Cameroon, this is by matching of the, the molecular genomes of the chimpanzee virus that was the precursor to our HIV, um, matching it geographically. Those chimpanzees in that area carry the virus that is the closest match. And then Michael Warby's work ascertained um, using molecular clock um, methodology and sequencing of different genomes, how long ago the spillover happened. So very different. And I tell that story in um, in spillover and, and um, 
and try and explain how it got from the southeastern corner of Cameroon to the rest of the world? So um, we are trying to develop a vaccine for COVID-19, but after all these years, we don't have a vaccine for HIV. So why don't we have a vaccine for that? And does that make you think we might not get a vaccine for COVID-19? Well, um, HIV is a retrovirus. It's a very different sort of virus. It's a fast evolving virus. Um, it evolves new strains even within the body of a single um, victim. Um, and it attacks the immune system. And the immune system is what we train um, to, um, to respond using vaccines. So uh, as Tony Fauci has explained much better than I can explain, um, um, there are very good reasons why it has been so difficult to develop an AIDS vaccine. This is a coronavirus. It shouldn't be that difficult. Um, it should be possible, not necessarily pronto, not necessarily in a year. We, I don't think we should underestimate the difficulties of creating a new vaccine, um, but it's a very different kind of thing. And I would think, based on what I hear from the experts, like, like Dr. Fauci and a number of others, that um, this should be considerably easier than getting a vaccine for HIV. All right. What is SARS? Where did that come from? SARS, the original coronavirus, or the original dangerous coronavirus. Um, it came out of southern China in 2002, um, the Pearl River Delta area, the city of Shenzhen, uh, and some, some other places, um, spilled over from a wild animal, ultimately, almost certainly from a bat, but possibly through an intermediate animal that the bat infected that might have been a civet, which is a kind of mammal that sort of looks like a badger. A wild animal is treated as food. So it got into humans. It got to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, it got to um, four or five cities around the rest of the world very quickly, from the Hong Kong airport to Toronto, to Singapore, to Bangkok, to Beijing. And, um, and it had a very high case fatality rate, almost 10%. It was a very, very dangerous outbreak. Um, as experts from the CDC have told me, I remember back in 2006, they were saying, one particular fellow was, Dr. Ali Khan was saying, SARS, SARS in 2003, that was more dangerous than Ebola, that was more dangerous than anything. We were very lucky that we stopped it. Why was it so dangerous? Well, because it, it had a high case fatality rate, it was a coronavirus, it was evolvable, a number of other factors. Now, uh, you've done a pretty good job of scaring me about uh, interacting with animals, so, should I not go to zoos? Should I not go on hunting trips? Should I not go fishing? What should I avoid doing to make sure I don't get one of these viruses? Well, I would say um, when you travel the world, don't eat the bats. That's a good rule to live by. Don't eat the bats. Um, don't eat wild animals um, taken from the wild by other people. Now there's the question of chronic wasting disease this prion disease, so far thought not to infect humans, this particular prion, but carried very much by, um, by deer and elk in, uh, in the Midwest, northern Midwest and the West. Um, that's a little bit scary. Uh, the cautionary principle is pushing me away from, I don't deer or elk hunt myself, friends give me uh, meat, and, and I'm, I'm now saying, you know what, thank you, but I, I will pass on that. The cautionary principle. So today, uh, as you um, talk about this, what is the main message you want to give to people about how they should avoid getting this kind of problem, or or how they should interact with animals when they do so if they're not even hunting? That's you know going in on a safari is that a risk as well? Well, I guess the main the main point that I'd like to make is a little bit broader than that. And that is that this pandemic, this emergency that we're facing now is not a one-off thing. It's not a one-time experience. It's not something that simply happened to us. It reflects things that we have been doing in the world, we humans, and it's part of a pattern. And the pattern is all of these other viruses that have emerged from wild animals in the last 50 or 60 years and either scared us, killed a few people, or killed a lot of people and become very dangerous. Um, all of these things reflect things that humans are doing. And it's not just going to a wet market and buying, um, uh, buying a snake for dinner or buying a civet for dinner. It's, um, it's the power of human population and human consumption. We are making demands on the natural world. We are pulling resources of all sorts, 
timber, minerals, fossil fuels, um, animals, plants. We are pulling them toward us for our purposes, for our uses, for our com consumption. We're even pulling the mineral coltan, which is necessary for cell phones and laptop computers. So if I own a cell phone and a laptop computer, I am a customer for coltan, which is mined in just a few places, including the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, where miners uh, are pulling it out of the ground. And what are they eating? Well, they're probably eating wild animals. So by commissioning them to go in there and mine coltan, I am essentially taking some responsibility for this contact between humans and wild animals, you know, porcupines and bats and lowland gorillas. All of our choices, how many children we have, if we have children, what we eat, what we buy, how much we travel, all of those choices put pressure on the natural world, bring resources toward us, but also bring viruses toward us. So my message is think about your footprint. Think about your footprint because your footprint ultimately results in um, forces that lead toward pandemic. By the way, are there diseases that humans have that we transfer to animals or that doesn't happen very much? Oh yeah, that does happen. For instance, there's a great risk that we can pass human respiratory infections to mountain gorillas when people go to visit the mountain gorillas in Eastern Congo or Rwanda. Uh, if they're sneezing and coughing, they're not allowed to go up and and spend time with the habituated mountain gorillas because you, they can potentially pass that infection to, um, to gorillas. Polio is another that has been, um, I think, proven or at least strongly suspected to have killed some of the, some of the chimpanzees, uh, for instance, at Gombe, Jane Goodall's uh, famous research site. So yes, it's, it's absolutely possible. It goes both ways. So as an expert in this area, um, how are you conducting your life during COVID-19? Uh, you live in Montana, where I don't think there's been that many COVID-19 cases, relatively speaking. So when you go out, do you wear a mask or do you not wear a mask? If I go in a building, I wear a mask. I have very seldom gone in a building in the last three months. I have lived in this office and in this house with my wife and our animals. So I'm taking it very seriously. Um, I'm, at this point, I probably have 0.0, .0 or 0 0.01 risk. Later, I'm going to be doing things where I'm going to have much more risk. I'm going to eventually have to get on an airplane and start to research this book uh, in person that I'm going to be writing on COVID-19. So while I can, while it's not necessary to expose myself or others to risk, I'm, I'm really, really isolating, hunkering down. So your next book, you just said, is on COVID-19. Was that what you intended to write on or somebody called you and said, why wouldn't you be the perfect person to write this? I was at work for Simon & Schuster on a book about um, cancer and evolution, cancer as an evolutionary phenomenon. And I had been in Tasmania in February researching that. I came home in March, this thing was blowing up and I heard from my um, publisher, David, would you please push that book to the back of your desk and give us a book on COVID-19? Here's a nice new contract, please. And my reaction was, well, I like to write books about things that other people are not writing about. And this is the opposite of that. Every publisher in New York is gonna have a COVID-19 book, but it's a new kind of challenge. Uh, so I, I embrace that and I'll write the best um, and, um, and most uniquely useful COVID-19 book I can manage to write in the, somehow in the next two years. You know what the theme is basically, or you know exactly what you're gonna cover? No, I have some idea of what I'm deeply interested in. I'm interested in the science. I'm interested in the origins of this whole thing. Um, it's going to be hard to get into China. It's going to be hard to accompany Chinese scientists into the field. That's what I would usually do for a book like this. Uh, if I can, that's great. If I can't, I have to find other ways to research this book. I'm particularly interested in the in the ecology and evolutionary biology of the COVID-19 phenomenon. And of course, the ecology of this virus includes the human population. We are part of ecology. David, I thoroughly enjoyed your book. I learned a lot. I was scared a little bit, so I'm not even sure I want to pet a dog anymore. But uh, I want to thank you for uh, exposing this problem and letting people know about it. And I hope they will read this book. So I want to thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the New York Historical Society for making this uh, interview and discussion possible. I'd like to thank Louise Mirror, the president of the New York Historical Society, for putting everything together. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, David. Real pleasure to talk with you. Thank you.